How did I go from this sketch to this kick-ass animation? Stick around to find out. G'day everyone, Dicko here with another kick-ass walkthrough. And you might be wondering, why the hell is he outside? Well, firstly, it's hot as hell in Australia at the moment, and it's the middle of summer. So why not sit outside and have a little bit of fun and chat to you guys about what I'm about to show you in this video. The other thing is that my office is an absolute mess at the moment, so I'm not going to go in there and try and set everything up perfectly because I can't be... Well, you know what I mean. Anyway. So this video is all about how I created this 3D animation from this sketch presented by MBNE. He's a patron of my YouTube channel. Um, and every so often I allow or ask my patrons to submit a bunch of sketches of their own making. And then I draw that from a hat and then I say, okay, you won. And then I recreate that in 3D. And it's a really fun little thing that I do every now and then. And I learn a lot from it. It's also a really fascinating way to sort of stretch my creative muscles a little bit without me having to do everything from scratch, which is great. So if you want to get in on the fun, you can sign up to my Patreon, join the Discord channel. And then every so often, I'll open up this competition. You get to submit some sketches. You get to join in the conversation. And you may even have the opportunity for me to recreate your artwork in 3D, which is really, really fun. And of course, if you just want to like and subscribe the video, feel free. Any support helps. It's great to see you here anyway. All right. So let's jump right into the video and talk about how I approach this particular project. Now, this one is really an overview on how I reuse assets and not only reuse assets that I've made myself, but also how I reuse assets from other sources, whether it's through the Blender website or through commercial websites as well. And I think that's really important to understand that not every single project has to be built from scratch, especially when you're limited by time. And of course, when you know that if you have this access, access to these things, you can still create really great, unique artwork without having to do everything from scratch. So I want to show you how I approach this. And of course, talk about a few other things along the way. Anyway, let's save the waffling for the end. <laughs> so let's jump right into it. Upon looking at the actual concept art, I noticed that there were some similarities in terms of proportion and physicality to the previous model I just made for the XP pen review. And I thought, why not just reuse that? So I removed the parts that I didn't need and then replaced the head with a skull from the Blender free asset library that features a actual full on skull. So that was easy to replace. And then I just decided to go through and reshape the proportions of the model that I already have so I could save a little bit of time in the process. At the same time, I had a look at my model. I wanted to optimize it a little bit. So I took some time to fix up certain parts that I thought were a bit iffy, a bit crappy, and things I noticed that didn't deform very well in the previous video. I then go ahead and then change out the hands to match the sketch. And this was actually the hardest part of the entire modeling process because I had to kind of remodel the hand from scratch. And I also wanted to optimize the deformation of it as well. I don't know why I do this in these sort of videos, but I always am a stickler for at least decent edge flow <laughs> around the hands. And it does get in the way of just getting things done quickly. That being said, I'm happy with the result and I wanted to keep it relatively low poly. So either I could sculpt a sculpt pass or maybe just do it inside a substance painter, which is what I did eventually. But all I wanted was the bare essentials for the hand. There wasn't going to be any separate parts, even though it meant to be a kind of bony, undead kind of feel to it. But I figured let's save some time, let's save some effort and just keep it as simple as possible. Now, there is an option that I could have done that I didn't even think about at the time because I already had the skull. I could have found a pre-made skeletal hand, but I didn't even think about it at the time. And in the end, I'm actually quite happy that I didn't because again, looking for that sort of stuff can take time and I wasn't all that fussy about having to make it as realistic as possible. This is a fantasy creature after all. So who gives a shit really? And again, this is all for fun. It's not like it's gonna be used in an animation or used in a game or used in any sort of fashion like that. I don't really need to optimize. I don't really need to worry about that sort of stuff. So let's just have some fun with it. That being said, and me being me, you could easily animate with this structure, with this model. If you download the file, you can probably animate it really easily. Now, with that being done, the proportions are all set. It's now time to do the clothes, which are basically going to be an extrusion or a copy of the original body mesh 
and then just pick and choosing the parts of the mesh that I want to turn into clothing. So in this case, I got the shoes extruded from the legs. Pretty simple stuff. They're just extracted from there. And then I just shape the feet to match the shoes. Very simple stuff. As for the clothing around the body, this is probably one of the simplest costumes that I had to do for these Patreon style challenges that I do for myself with my members because it's basically just a corset with a set of sleeves. Now, the great thing about the corset is that it actually matches the topology of the body that I already have. So I didn't have to actually do any real reshaping or massive retopper on the clothing, which is great for me. Saves a lot of time in that regard. Um, that being said, there are going to be some modifications to the clothing mesh, but they aren't that major. And for the most part, it's really just removing mesh objects than it is about adding new stuff with the exception around the shoulders here. So I noticed that the shoulders in the sketch have this sharpness to it. And I really wanted to make sure that that sharpness was accentuated in the 3D model. So a little bit of kajiggering around the shoulder, extending that shoulder out a little bit more beyond the, uh, the body mesh. And that allowed me to get this nice sharp sort of tailored look around the shoulder area. Now, depending on how much fidelity you need in your design, so how realistic you want it to be or how high poly you want it to be, you can go crazy with these sort of things and you can develop the sketch even further to have more realism. So you can have the core set be ultra realistic with all the sort of bells and whistles that, that comes with that. So for instance, the stitching and the way that the leather is joined, that sort of thing. You can technically model that into every part of the costume. But that being said, a lot of the time, it's probably just easier to either sculpt that detail into the base mesh, which is an option here, or you can just directly texture the detail in say something like Substance Paint or within Blender itself. And that's the method that I chose for this particular model. I didn't want to have to bother and spend tons and tons of time sculpting in tons of detail that ultimately isn't all that necessary to achieve the look that I want for this model. And I knew that Substance had these cool tools, especially in the latest versions, that allowed me to get really quick stitching or really quick embroidery and all that sort of stuff out of the textures and then export that into Blender for rendering. So I really wanted to try those out too. Okay, so the main part of the costume is pretty much done. So now we need to figure out how to do the cloth, the dress part of the whole setup. So the dress itself is not very clear in the sketch. But what we can tell from the line work is that it kind of looks like the fabric sits underneath the corset. So that's the sort of approach I went with this in this regard. So the dress is broken up into two major chunks. One is the overall flowy part that sits from the front of the leg to the back of the leg and around the body. So that's sort of like the large draped part of the dress. And then there are separate pieces of fabric on top of that which make up that ruffly part at the front. So the green and black parts that sit on front of the dress. Now, as you can see, doing simulation can be a real pain in the butt. <laughs> it can take a lot of trial and error and it never really gets to the point where you can be 100% happy with it, at least without some sort of dedicated software. Now, what I will say is that one tip I have, if you uh, want to create clothing uh, especially dynamic clothing, is to do some research on how clothing is actually made, how the cuts are designed, that sort of thing, because it really does help in creating the right kind of flow for the clothes to be simulated upon. The other thing is just learning to understand Blender's quirks when it comes to doing fabric simulation to begin with. So collisions are really finicky. So hell, I might even need to make a whole new video just on fabrics itself. So if you are interested in the Dicko method on doing this, feel free to drop a comment and let me know. Ultimately, after a lot of trial and error and I'm fucking around in Blender, we got this, which I was really happy with. And once I was happy with that draped effect, I then applied the simulation by converting, inverted commas, it to a mesh, which basically applies all of the modifiers. And then I do a refining pass with the sculpt brushes to sort of smooth out any rough edges around the corset area. I still want the corset to sit on top of the dress, but at the moment, because of the simulation, it's sort of crumpled at the front and at the back. So I need to go ahead and clean that up manually. Now, this isn't difficult to do. All you gotta do really is grab the smooth brush and just soften out any 
clumps, any bits that are overlapping, move things around where needed, and just go with the flow with this one. It's not difficult. It won't really break anything. Just try not to overdo it and just accidentally remove half of the ruffles or half of all the creases that you like in the drapery that you've created with the simulation. And luckily in this case, I can hide a lot of the mistakes or any of the sort of quirks of the mesh because the core set's gonna cover it anyway, so who cares? The only real disadvantage of this method of simulating the cloth for the final design is the poly count because the poly count becomes massive, relatively speaking, to the rest of the mesh because you need to have the geometry to be able to simulate it to. Now, the second part of the dress is known as a flounce ruffle, according to Google and according to YouTube and all the actual real life fashion making tutorial pages on YouTube, which is awesome. So basically I replicated the pattern that I saw from those YouTube channels, non 3D mind you, not 3D tutorial channels, and then replicated that inside of Blender to get the simulation to do what I wanted to do. And I was so surprised at how close to the actual real life tutorials the effect was with the flounces. They came out really nicely. And it just goes to show you how important it is to actually get your brain and get your mindset out of just the 3D world, the character design world, and into the real world to see how real things are done so you can replicate that in your artwork. It's so important. I keep saying this in my channel as well here and there, and I can only reiterate it again. Getting out into the real world or seeing things done in a real world setting will greatly improve the outcomes of your character designs in the future. Now what I did here that I think I wish I did a little bit differently with this particular part of the simulation was that I wish I did the flounces simulated in isolation and then used a lattice modifier to sort of match it to the dress. I think that would have made even better flounces in this case, but at the time, I wasn't even thinking in that regard, so I just went with full 100% simulation for all of the flounces, which is why the front flounce looks awesome and the side ones look a little bit more looser. So I wish I just used lattices with that one flounce at the front and then sort of replicated it across. It would have looked a little bit cleaner, a little bit more professional looking, but in the end, it still looks great. And I love the drapery overall and the final outcome here. I was really surprised overall at how quick it was to get a decent result after following those really simple textile tutorials. All right, so going into the final little bits and bobs of the costume, these parts are actually pretty simple. There's a little skull at the front of the dress that I wanted to use. So I just duplicate the actual skull, make it smaller. I chopped off the back of it and then just rammed it in between the boobies and Bob's your uncle. We got ourselves a little Dimenti skull at the front of the costume. And of course, for the collar, which isn't present yet, I decided to just extrude that out according to the topology of the neckline. Again, really simple way of doing things. There's not much else to it. And then just sort of shaping it accordingly, adding geometry where I need to, making sure it matches, relatively speaking, the sketch that I have on hand. And that's pretty much it. Um, and then with a little bit of refinement, a little bit of tinkering, we got ourselves a nice little collar. And as for the flaming skull, you'd be surprised at how simple this actually can be done. All I have to do is use the quick smoke button in the menu, up on the object menu, and it created the, the flames and the smoke. I removed the smoke because I wanted to have it feel a little more um, un un unreal, I guess you can say, like weirdly magical and removing the smoke helped to keep it simple as well. The simulation was much simpler as well. And it also allowed me to have a much simpler shader setup too. Now there are tons of tutorials out there on how to do smoke and fire inside of Blender. So I recommend just checking those out and following them along. And of course it all depends on your needs, the power of your computer and what you want to achieve in the style of that fire. So check those out, there's tons out there. Just have some fun with it. Now, as for the final piece of the costume, there's this little skull on the shoulder. I just used Quixel's Mega Scans for those. Just found a skull that kind of looked cool, exported it directly into Blender with their little add-on, and there it is. Just plonk it onto the shoulder. I didn't bother putting any straps on it or anything like that because, again, it would 
most likely be the case where the straps aren't even going to be all that visible with the lighting setup that I want to use for this as well. So I just want to put it on there and it gives the right sort of silhouette anyway. And that's what is more important to me in this particular design. So let's just go with that, plonk it on, good to go. Let's move on to the texturing. Now, one thing I did know that I wanted to do from the start of this project is that I wanted to use Substance Painter to create the costume. Now, the reason for this is numerous, but one of the biggest reasons was because Substance Painter has brought out some really cool features in the last few versions that I really wanted to try out. And namely, one of those is the path drawing tool, which basically allows you to use Illustrator-like paths to create patterns like stitches and detailing and embroidery and that sort of thing. And I thought I gotta check that out. And it's fucking amazing when you use it for the first time. It's such a lifesaver. It's such a time saver. I love it. This is one of those reasons where you can justify purchasing or paying for software over say, doing it all manually in Blender. Now I understand that not many people who watch my channel can afford to use Substance Painter or even get a one-off purchase or anything like that but if you are in a professional setting and you are moving into a professional setting uh, as an artist or starting to become a professional i highly recommend that you at least invest into something like substance painter it will save you time it will save you money in the long run and it is absolutely awesome now one of the first things i started off with here was the skull and as you can see there's actual bone materials they're straight up in the library. All I have to do is download them uh, from the Adobe Cloud directly into Substance Painter. I was able to use it within a few minutes and then on, on, on my way to creating a really cool skull texture. Now, I've also gone ahead and added a little bit of teeth, like a bit of whiteness in the teeth to give it a little bit of variety. And as you can see here, that in the bake of my hand or of the bony hands here, there's not much detail. Now, I have to actually paint that in manually here um, in a very similar fashion to sculpting. Now, doing it manually in Substance Painter with just textures can be quite time consuming if you don't know what you're doing in terms of like just knowing how to paint in general, like how to do shading and stuff like that, like shading in a painterly sense. Now, I'm not perfect at that either. And technically, you most likely would get a better result in terms of detail sculpting it directly in Blender in 3D. But again, I wanted to try this out and try and do a sort of more handcrafted approach here. So what I'm doing here is just blocking out the sort of shading or the shadow parts or the ambient occlusion, I guess you can say between the bone joints that would be there if they were separate pieces. Um, this is similar to how I would do it with a 3D sculpt, except it's just a, a flat image at this point. And then I use Substance's tools to sort of emulate or fake depth inside of the textures with normal maps and height maps and that sort of stuff. And that gets me about, I would say about 70% of the way there versus doing a proper sculpt. But that being said, because I can see it in real time with the shading turned on and with the lighting and all that sort of stuff, I do find this to be a good alternative if you don't have the capacity to do a high poly sculpt inside of Blender. Because again, doing high poly sculpts in Blender can be quite taxing on the system. Whereas doing something that's a bit more textured such as doing it in Substance Painter or texturing it directly in Blender or even in Photoshop, it can be much less taxing on your computer. And again, if you're not planning on getting super close up to those objects inside of your 3D viewport, like getting right up and close and personal to see all the problems with the mesh or with the texturing, then you could probably get away with a lot. In this case, I decided to just take the gamble and do that anyway. And in the end, I'm actually quite happy with the result. It's not as detailed as the skull. The skull is a full-on sculpted multi-res model available through the Blender website. It's awesome. So I'm not gonna get to that level of fidelity because at one, I don't have the time. And two, I don't have the motivation to do that <laughs> for one, but I do have the motivation to just paint it in. So that's why I chose this method, or at least this approach to doing the bony hand. Also, side note, if you are doing low poly texturing, so you're texturing on a low poly asset, this method is awesome. <laughs> you can paint on low poly and make anything that's low poly look much more detailed than you think. Like ridiculous detail can be brought through texturing to make any low poly object feel 
really detailed and really high fidelity. You'd be surprised at how low poly some AAA assets really are when you rip them out from a game engine. And that is including of the most recent AAA titles as well. Okay, so for the body, I'm not gonna really be seeing much of the body in this model because it's covered by clothes. So I'm only really gonna do a very simple uh, pass over the over the skin. So wherever the, the skin is showing, just a little bit of variation in the tonality of the skin and that's it. I'm not gonna go any further than that because the real hero of this particular design really is the corset and the dress. So I really wanted to pay attention to that part of the model the most. Now, one of the challenges of the sketch is that there's no real information on the kind of materials that are going to be used on that character. So it's up to me to sort of decide and make up as I go along what looks cool. And I came across this crocodile leather skin texture in the substance library. And I thought that's gotta be the one. I mean, it, it matches the sort of weird underground sorceress sort of vibe that's being given from the sketch. Got to use it, it's awesome. And the detail is amazing as well. So that's really cool. And that's the thing about all substance materials as well. They're high, high detail. Now, one other cool feature of Substance Painter is the ability to sort of use the UV seams as a masking operator. So basically I can sort of use the seams around the mesh and create a mask around it to create detail that would otherwise take ages for me to paint manually. So as you can see here within seconds, I was able to get this gold trim around all of the mesh. And all I needed to do after that is just refine what was already there or remove things that were generated on top of that. And the cool thing about all this stuff, especially within Substance Painter, is that it's all non-destructive, which means I can always bring it back if I wanted to. I could modify it, change it, change the color, change the material. I can do whatever and it will just work on the fly. So after cleaning up that body a little bit and getting that trim to match the sketch, I was then able to start working on the gold embroidery that was sitting on top of the leather. Now, after about, about 15 minutes, I got tired of doing that. and was like, nah, fuck that. I'm going to use a textured alpha channel uh, texture that I would create to create all that sort of flourish. So I found a Baroque tattoo design that I thought looked perfect for the sleeves of this character. So basically, I just traced it in Photoshop, turned it into an alpha texture for substance painter and that then can be used as a mask inside a substance painter and i can move that around wherever i want to in the software and these are those sort of things that make you go okay i get it i can understand why it's worth having this software um, this is something that you can do in blender you can do this in blender but it is far more finicky to pull off far more finicky it's not impossible it just takes ages and it's a pain in the ass. You gotta set up all the nodes. You gotta manually change the nodes if you have to make an additional change to the texture. It's a real time sink. Um, whereas in Substance Painter, it's much faster, much more efficient. And then on top of that, once I did the costuming, uh, the main costume, I noticed that there was these straps that were sitting on top of the mesh, which I didn't model into the character directly. So I decided to just texture them and then add some fake highlight and fake shadow to sort of emulate these belts and then on top of that i added these emission symbols which are just made up gibberish it doesn't mean anything um to to look like magic emanating from these belts and again that can be done quite easily in substance painter because you can automatically create uh, emission passes that you can paint directly into with a mask in substance and that will export out appropriately into a texture map so after that a few other changes on top and we're done. The costume is pretty much finished. Um, and with a few extra tweaks here and there, I added a few seams along the side of the corset. I added some padded leather on the inside of the collar to give it a little bit more variation. And then of course I did the boots to wrap it all up. And again, this took about a, a day to put together. Um, on top of that, I had to make some custom uh, alpha channel maps that were sort of patterned inside of Photoshop. Now, one feature that I only discovered literally a few weeks ago was the pattern preview function in Photoshop, which is absolutely such a lifesaver. <laughs> I can't believe I never knew about this beforehand because it allows you to make patterns really easily in Photoshop. Can't believe I didn't know that existed. But that once I did that, I just dragged and dropped the pattern into uh, 
Substance Painter, use it as a alpha channel mask to get this sort of padded effect on the inside of the collar. And yeah, that's pretty much all there is to it. Now, of course, I've glossed over a lot here and there's so many different things that I wish I could cover in more detail in this video. But again, half an hour, you can only talk about so much. So if you see anything that you find to be interesting out of any of these particular chapters that you want me to elaborate on, please let me know because I do plan on making some more up-to-date videos on one, stylized character design, uh, some animation and some rigging stuff. So if I ever bring something up that you go, well, that's interesting, I haven't heard about that, please let me know in the comments so you can just tag me, just tag me in and say like, look, this is awesome, but I have never heard about this. I would like to hear a little bit more detail, how it works, blah, blah, blah. Just, just do that. And then I can store that into my little note had in my brain or on my phone or something like that, things to talk about in the future. So uh, please let me know if you think, see anything that is of interest to you, whether or not I should cover it in more detail in the future. Okay, so once I've finished the texturing in Substance Painter, it's time to export those out into Blender. So they're just image textures that I've exported out as PNGs, and now it's time to bring it into Blender. Basically now I use the um, Node Wrangler add-on to bring in all the textures within about five minutes. A quick refresh of all the nodes to be recognized as UDIM tiles and a refresh and it's recognized and now all the textures are working as well, which is again, amazing. Um, I also added a little bit of displacement to get a little bit more detail out of the mesh. The cool thing about the Node Wrangler add-on is that it sets up all the nodes for you. And again, this is included in Blender in the vanilla version of Blender. So you can just enable it and it will automatically work for you. Now, the final piece of the puzzle you might be asking is, why didn't you texture the skirt in Substance Painter? And the reason is, is that I just couldn't be fucked. UV unwrapping the dress. <laughs> it would take too long to straighten out all the UVs. And I couldn't be bothered. So I just used a procedural material inside of Blender, which is real simple. It's basically a metallic with a sheen turned up to one and a noise texture uh, added to the roughness map with some detail cranked up. And that's it. And that's how I get this sort of velvety like texture that has a bit of a metallic feel to it to make it look a little bit like crushed velvet. And I think it worked quite effectively, especially when you pull the camera away. Okay, so a quick Mixamo auto rig later and a little bit of posing, a little bit of uh, post-production on top of the render, and we get this. All right, what did you think? I think this turned out really, really cool. I'm really happy with the result. It was really fun to recreate. And of course, we had this awesome animation to come with it as well. Uh, I really was surprised at how easy it was to get the flames working. Usually in the past, I had such an issue that you always had end up having to do this for hours and hours and hours. Luckily with this one, it came up really well, really fast, which is awesome. Anyway, if you enjoy this video, again, feel free to like, subscribe and all that sort of good stuff. If you want to get more from this channel and you want to support the channel further, feel free to sign up for the Patreon as well. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments. I read every single one and I try to reply to every single one of well. So I'll catch you in the next one. Enjoy the rest of the day. Catches.